Good afternoon, and it's a great place to be inside on a rainy day like today. So my name's Tim Pyatt, and I'm the dean of the Z Smith Reynolds Library. And on behalf of the library and the library lecture series committee, I'm glad to welcome you here to what is already a fast start this semester for our third library lecture um, this, this, uh, this semester. Um, today we have a real treat. Um, Dr. Robert Brown, who's been a professor here for, for 38 years, is going to speak to us today. Um, he's an ecologist who is interested in the variety of areas, including rare and endangered birds in the Galapagos, small mammals and salamanders in the Appalachian, Appalachians, and I'm a fly fisherman. I got scared to death by hellbenders, so I'm sure you've seen, yeah, seen those. Um, that the first time I saw one of those, I thought, there can't be a salamander that big. Um, and invertebrates that live in salt lakes. Uh, he's conducted research in 24 countries and is the recipient of a Senior Research Fulbright Award and was elected as a fellow of the American Association of Science. His talk today will, be, will focus on the research he conducted last summer at Oxford in England as part of the Nathan and Julie Hatch Research Grant for Academic El Excellence Award. Uh, the title of his talk is The Ancient Woodlands of, of England. Um, I'm especially excited to hear his talk today as the forests of England, for me, there's a, there always have been like a character in the stories I've read from King Arthur to Robin Hood, uh, and, and probably many of us also have that similar experience sort of reading and hearing about them. Um, you know, it's interesting, these legends linger today, I always find it kind of ironic that I live in Sherwood Forest. Um, so you can see that you know, medieval England and the well, this ancient forest make it all the way to Winston-Salem. Um, but today I think what's interesting, a lot of times we hear the, the tales and the mythology is surrounding it, but today we're going to learn a little bit about the science and the ecology and about the biodiversity. So I think this is going to be really kind of a, a new look at those forests. So with that, I'll welcome Dr. Brown. And uh, thank you for coming out on this kind of gray day. And it is kind of nice to see that Sherwood Forest connection. And I was just thinking, uh, and I'll, I'll highlight a little bit about Sherwood Forest today. But I went to graduate school in upstate New York and outside the School of Forestry uh, in New York, uh, in Syracuse, they had the Robin Hood Oak, which they planted from, uh, from Caesar. And I hadn't even thought about that that much. There was a little bit of continuity there. So, so some of you, I think, uh, have been to the Royal House, uh, maybe, uh, and certainly I've been to London. And London, uh, the next time you're there, is actually surrounded by some of the really old ancient forests. Uh, and one of those is Hampstead Heath, which is only about mm, 10 minute, 15 minute walk from uh, the Royal House. And I was there as a resident professor about two and a half years ago and loved to go up in the Hampstead Heath. And much of that is still laid out as it was in medieval times and has a some quite ancient forest with it. So if you're in that area, you can just drop in and, and see some ancient forest even pretty closely to uh, that area. So, uh, so today I'll talk about a little bit of background on ancient forests, what they are here in North Carolina, what they are or in North America, what they are in the UK, and how they contrast quite a bit in that regard. Talk a little bit about the land management practices with them and then a little bit about the biodiversity and hopefully um, won't spend too much time on, on ultra hard science anyway. So let's see if I have this correct. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so some of you may have been in virgin or ancient forest here in North America. Uh, most of that is going to be in the western part of the US and we tend to call it North virgin forest here. Uh, that is, it was never cut. Um, and there's a slight distinction between that and ancient forests because we do now have here in the east, including in North Carolina, some forests that were only cut maybe about 200 years ago once. And if that's grown back, it'll have much of the characteristics of uh, a, a virgin forest as well. So we kind of have that distinguishing part that here it could be virgin. And we tend to call ancient forests anything more than 200 years old. Now in Europe, and especially in the UK, the definition of an ancient forest is it has to be 500 years old, and it has to be continually, continuously maintained as forest since then. It's often going to be much older. Some of this is going to date back to the Domesday record of around, around 1100. And some of it, although that's a little bit of a stretch, but um, some of it may go back to what they call wildwood. That is, it was never cut even in England. But that's a little more problematic to establish. But biologically, there's some indicators from that as well. 
Okay, so if you've been to the Great Smoky Mountains, uh, that area is the largest amount of virgin or ancient forest in the east. It's along the crest line there primarily, but we also have fragments uh, in Limbo Gorge, um, in Joyce Kilmer uh, Park, um, and we actually have a little, we might have a little bit here in, even in Forsyth County, among some very steep banks along Muddy Creek, but those are going to be really small, um, where they were not cut um, in those areas. Okay, so we see that most of the ancient forest, the, the really wild forest, has been removed uh, since humans have been kind of taking over much of the terrain and cutting those forests. So the, what's left nowadays is primarily going to be the boreal forest belt up there and in the tropics. And at least on a broad scale, we don't have much at all here in North America or in Europe. But we do have some little fragments, and they're really pristine jewels and really kind of fascinating places to go, one of which is Wiesha Forest in Poland on the Belarusia. That's the largest one in Europe uh, and was preserved for a variety of reasons, but like almost every else, anything else in Europe was primarily a royal holding and protected by whatever regent there was at the time. And this one is... Um, still quite pristine, still has European bison. Uh, the only place where you still have European bison, there's a herd of about 600 there. And uh, until recently, it's been very difficult to visit that area or work in it. So I have not, I've been to Poland, but I know I actually visited that forest, but would love to go uh, sometime. Okay, so there's a distinction in the UK that we tend to kind of gloss over here a little bit. If we talk about forest and woodlands in the US, we think those are kind of synonyms. But in the UK, there's actually a pretty big distinction between them that even you know, people who aren't scientists would probably uh, recognize. So in a forest in England, if, you if you've ever been to places like the Forest of Dean or places like that, they, you may be surprised because it's not necessarily going to be wooded. Okay? What it is, it's the area where forest law applied, which were a distinct set of laws from the king or queen, and gave the inhabitants there certain rights and also certain inhibitions as to what they could do with the land management. So it's actually where forest law went. It may or may not have ancient woodlands within it. Okay. We also have wood pasture. So if you want to go see the biggest trees, the oldest trees in England, some of which can go back to 1,500 years old, you would probably go to wood pasture. And those, at least as far as the above ground portion of the tree, because they are areas that were usually on either royal holdings or on very large um, estates. They were left up by the owners, both for practical reasons, to protect the livestock that were in there. So they're in these pasture lands, a lot of sheep, sometimes cattle and it gave them refuge from storms and, and winter times from wind and things like that. And they also liked them for the aesthetic. They had a, a really nice look to them. And uh, those are where the really biggest old trees are, mostly going to be oaks. Okay, and there's, we'll talk a little bit more about the oaks. But the biggest collection of old pasture trees was just actually discovered in about the last two years or so. And that's on the Blenheim estate. But anybody historian here that might ring a bell, but that's Churchill's home, and it's only about 30 miles north of, uh, of Oxford, and they have the largest collection of what we would call massive um, wood pasture oak primarily. So we also have wildwoods. So those are areas like our virgin forest that were never cut. Mm, establishing those in England is a little more problematic, or a lot more problematic. So we don't, but some areas are expected to be wildwood. Again, very small, probably a couple hectares, maybe five acres, maybe in some of these areas that may not have been cut. The part I'm going to concentrate on today is going to be ancient woodlands. And these were almost directly, or a little bit later indirectly, were going to be royal holdings. So they were under the king's or queen's direct control, and they were usually former hunting areas, sometimes deer parks, 
Um, they were sometimes maintained just for the woodlands, especially for naval reserves where they wanted large trees, large oaks to build the ships. And um, later on, at the time of Henry VIII, uh, of course, monastic holdings were quite large and extensive throughout England. And then pretty much Henry VIII took them all away and confiscated them. So they became royal holdings uh, later on. But even now, when you look at the historical records for these, a lot of smaller ones, you'll, it's called Monk's Woods. Uh, there's a lot of Monk's Woods actually scattered throughout England, some of which are uh, ancient woodlands. Okay, so this is one of those big oaks from uh, on the Blenheim estate, and there are close to 100 of them there, and they didn't really realize they were there. I don't know how they missed them, but uh, maybe they just didn't allow, but they did allow tourists to go through there, so I don't, I don't know why they, why they kind of missed those. But those are, if you want to see some really big old trees, um, that would be a good place to start. And we have some older trees that aren't quite so impressive size-wise or girth-wise, but this is a hornbeam from Hatfield Forest, which is in the eastern part of England as well. And uh, these aren't uh, quite as massive of trees by any means, but this one's kind of interesting because it was, it's, it's actually one tree genetically, and the heartwood rotted out of it. So now we have kind of these, this, this pair here uh, that's uh, from wood pasture. But part of Hatfield Forest was also heavily managed in coppicing and pollarding, which will which I'll talk about here uh, shortly. Okay, so uh, we covered most of that, uh, except for the last part here on managing. But the main point, another important point here is that most of these, there's one or two exceptions, are gonna be extremely small holdings. A hectare is about two and a half acres. So we're talking, most of them are gonna be less than 50 acres. A lot of them are in the five, seven, nine uh, range. So they're very small uh, ancient woodlands that have been around for at least 500 years, often more than 1,000 years. We, I only looked at uh, areas that were at least 500 years old, so I'll talk mostly about those. The other thing is, if you went to an ancient woodland here, you would expect to see, as you might in Joyce Kilmer, large, big trees. Clear that out of your mind. If you were an ancient woodland in England, you would mark, what it would be marked by is mostly really small trees because they were heavily managed, and it, uh, that's kind of what they kept them in their preserved state because they were quite valuable, and they were either coppiced or pollarded, which kept them in kind of a juvenile state. Uh, so that's one of the, so the, the area below ground may sometimes be 2,000 years old, the root system, but the wood coming out of it nowadays is probably just 200 or 300 years old at most, and some of them, if they've been continuously managed are much younger. They're, I mean, some of them can just be uh, uh, you know, 20, 30 years old. So, but the one thing is that these woodlands were really valuable. Uh, during medieval times, uh, a good managed woodland was much more valuable than a good cropland. So now we tend to think of forest land as, you know, compared to prime land in Iowa for corn or something like that. It's like, that's not gonna be as valuable. But in those days, you could do a lot of things with woodland. We tend to think of wood as wood products like lumber that could go into a house or maybe if it was really big, go into you know, some big beam or something like that. But most of their value was in things that they could cycle through pretty quickly. So they would harvest these anywhere from 10 to 20 years and they would have growth coming out. They would make that into poles, which nowadays we don't think are very valuable, but were really val valuable in medieval times. Uh, they could be in staves for barrels, things like that. But the biggest product was probably charcoal. So England in medieval times, getting less and less wooded, were before the Industrial Revolution with coal coming in. Heating your house was a real challenge, and especially in more urban areas, the prime way in which you're gonna do that is with charcoal, because you can transport it in. And charcoal is not made from big chunks of wood. It's mostly made from things that are about this big around. And, um, and then it, would, it could be harvested every 10, 15 years. And they would have a, these woodlands would be on a rotational system, so there would always be new uh, woods coming into production that they could use these various products for. So it was very labor intensive. And this system pretty much was one on a downhill pretty rapidly when coal came in. 
until around 1840, give or take, and then was maintained somewhat till about World War II. But then after that, labor became way too expensive and coppicing was pretty much just abandoned. So many of these old woodlands were almost all coppiced at one time or another, some of them continuously so, uh, but now they've kind of been for the last 100 plus years uh, has been abandoned, so there's often very big tree sprouts coming out of these coppice stools. Okay. The other thing that's kind of interesting about them, uh, it, when you, some of these were kind of difficult to uh, locate, uh, even with a GPS system, but since these were so valuable and they were royal holdings, they wanted to make sure that no one trespassed in there. You, it was a forest crime to go in and harvest things that you were not legally allowed to take. And you had all sorts of what, uh, privileges. So the village might have a privilege of collecting wood up to as high as you could collect. If a king or queen or whatever royal holding had it allowed you to do that, or they might allow you to come in and uh, take the dead wood, or they might let you run your pigs in there, or not. So there was all these strictures on what you could do. The worst thing you could ever do was to totally cut a tree and then remove the stump. Because even when the stumps were there, they could at least sprout back. So they wanted to have very strict control over this. No one could read, so they couldn't read no trespassing signs. Most of these are not, they're mo mostly gonna be located at all the ancient sites within about, a, about 100 miles of London. There's a few exceptions because that's where over a thousand years or so, the king or queen had a lot of control. You might think, oh, I'm going to find these wild areas out in Scotland or Wales, but those were not under central authority for very long or lapsed at various times, and as soon as the lapse went in, they would come in and, and cut those areas. So what they did to make sure that people knew you were going into a private, often royal uh, forest is they would, they would ditch it. They had unlimited manpower. So they would dig a five-foot deep ditch around it throw the soil up on a bank, and then they would put a natural hedge in of uh, hawthorn or something else, weave it in there, and that would tell people that if you go beyond that ditch, you are gonna lose various body parts if you get caught. Uh, and it was almost as bad as taking deer, which were also owned by the, by the, uh, the king or queen. So it was ditched, and it also served a purpose of keeping browsing animals out could be wild like deer uh, because they would come in and eat all the shoots and destroy the forest just like now we're having our forest pretty heavily altered by having too much deer they're going to be very selective on what they take on, on hardwood seedlings and things like that uh, and it also kept cattle out so both the wild and uh, domesticated herbivores were, were excluded from it okay so many of these we, we can date back to the Domesday the Domesday book of course was a very extensive uh, census of everything that was from virtually every village and sometimes with, was highly descriptive of how big these were. Uh, sometimes you had to do a little bit of work with them in terms of like, they would say, well, this forest was big enough to support 12 pigs. So you had to kind of extrapolate from that as to how, how big a forest would, that, that, that could support the, the acorns and the, and the hickories and things like that. But, but it was pretty, there was pretty formulaic to be able to do that. So, William the Conqueror uh, came in and, and set this up. We also have various slices in time when we know there were various four censuses taken. So we have this one in around 1320 or so, which showed what royal holdings occurred at the time. And then since we talked about Sherwood, uh, and we're all familiar with, at least with Robin Hood, which was pretty much a myth, but, um, but uh, we have various slices of time here for Sherwood Forest, where we have uh, forests that we knew existed at, at various periods from, this one would be a 19th century map, and then you could see which of these forests were maintained at, through these various increments. And many of them, of course, have 500-year-old trees on them, so it's relatively easy to, to um, be able to, to do that. And we even have, this one's, a, I like this one, this, this one is uh, actually a painting of the oaks of Sherwood Forest, and it's, it was done with ultra-realism, so they actually went through later and could identify which of those oaks were still there and how they had changed their crowns at various times, because they have all sorts of 
wind damage, but especially during droughts, they will kind of shed their crowns, kind of things will die off, and then they'll, and then, then they'll come back again. Some, so things that are very old often have this kind of stunted look, uh, usually from, from long spread droughts more than anything else, somewhat from, from lightning strikes, and, and occasionally they have really catastrophic high winds. But, um, and so we can compare these. Uh, this would be the present, uh, the Sherwood Forest in 1787. This is what it is now. And what forest is there now? But some of that, much of that that we see now, almost all of that that's in green now, would have been, quote, new forest. That is, it's sprung up in the last 500 years or so. But there are ancient forest fragments within it, and they're often delineated by this bank and ditch system. So, and, and we can document them other ways uh, biologically. So we would come by and, and look at these forests, and uh, some of these have identified by other, many of them have been identified by other people. And then we would kind of ground truth to see which of these would be uh, real forest, ancient forest. So we have some you know, magnificent old trees. But again, the big old trees are going to be primarily in wood pastures. And when you went to the older trees, unless they would be coppice stools, that sometimes, uh, it's probably exaggerating a little bit, but probably the biggest coppice stool I've ever seen is between here and the door. And, but coming out of this could be three or four huge trees but the coppice stool itself may be 700 years old. The big trees are actually what sprouted out from when they abandoned the coppicing in, say, 1840 or so. But the root system is so extensive, those things can grow pretty fast. Uh, so they're much more large than what you might think if they had, than if they had sprouted from, a, from an acorn or a, a new tree. We owe a huge debt for ancient forests, certainly of Europe and England in particular, to this man named Oliver Rackham. He was a undergraduate at Cambridge, became fascinated with some of the old woods around there, including Monk's Woods and some others. And then he started a whole documentation of uh, ancient forests with their use, ancient woodlands, and really put up the campaign to preserve these. So by between World War II and about 1970, about two-thirds of the ancient woodlands in England were destroyed. Uh, primarily because they had no little, they had little economic value anymore. They're not going to be coppiced, they're not going to be polarded or anything like that. So they were destroyed, and now there's, even in the time I've been working on them, because this is kind of not my major research focus, um, there is, in the 10, 15 years I've been doing this a little bit with England, now there's a huge push to preserve every piece of ancient woodlands uh, within within England, and a lot of it really is traced back to, to him. So the management techniques that were common in medieval times were primarily coppicing and pollarding, and virtually every forest in England was coppiced or pollarded, because that's where you got it, your greatest economic benefit from it. So this was basically where you're going to cut the trees, and only some trees would do this, but most of the hardwoods, is that true? Hmm. Yeah, at least half the hardwoods of England uh, will re-sprout. They're not going to be true for evergreen trees. Once you cut them, they're pretty much gone. But you could cut oaks, you could cut ash, you could cut hazel, you could cut virtually all, almost all the hardwoods, limes, beeches, and given the right conditions, they're going to sprout back up from the stumps. And compassing was when you cut it pretty much at, at ground level and just allowed those to come back and then that, those shoots you would then put on a rotational cycle and cut like every 15 to 20 years and turn them into these various wood products. Pollarding is the same principle, except for rather than do it at this level, you do it about shoulder level. And that wasn't as good for manpower because it's much harder to cut at this level than it is down below. But what it did do is it preserved the shoots from being grazed upon by deer or cattle. The cattle couldn't, and they'll, they'll get up on their hind legs and reach up, but the deer at the time there uh, were primarily fallow deer. There wasn't much red deer at all, so they're smaller deers than our, than our uh, white-tailed deer. So they couldn't get up too much more higher than this, nor could the cattle. So you could keep that, they wouldn't come in and then tear off these shoots, and cattle and deer both love these new shoots, and they will eat them if preferentially over grass or anything else. So they, if you had heavy grazing, you would pollard, and if you didn't, if you really could seal that area off well, or if there wasn't local herbivores nearby, uh, you would probably 
So some of these now have been kind of abandoned, just some of these old oak uh, pollarded are, are really quite kind of spectacular because they, they produce this knobby growth and then they've kind of been abandoned from pollarding over the last 150 years or so. So they have these kind of fantastic shapes to them, very kind of eerie and you know, a little spooky when you, when you go through them in the, you know, in the mist. So. so a typical system would be you'd have the stumpage. The stumpage could be quite those stumps, not those particular ones, but we have stumps um, in high fields. I'll actually show you a picture of that. that they think go back to Roman times that Romans had established a pottery nearby and they had, and actually the whole system of coppicing probably was introduced on a formal basis from, uh, from the Romans. So they kind of introduced how you would kind of set up this coppicing system and you would have continuous charcoal to be able to fuel your, in this case, their potteries and be able to fire up those pots. So you would have these older stumps and then just after you cut them, the new growth would come out. And this happens naturally, I mean here in North Carolina, but only for some trees. We have a, smaller subset of trees that that would occur for. I, until recently, I used to own about 50 acres right up near Pilot Mountain, and it had been cut before I bought it. And boy, everything was sprouting out there. And, it's, and it grows very quickly because this, this root system is already established there. It can pull up those nutrients and water pretty easily. So after about 12 years, especially if you had it nice in these nice neat rows, which may or may not occur, you'd have this growth come out. You'd cut it a little bit after that. Uh, and then you would sort those, those various wood products into maybe, at that point, it's probably not going to be much in the way of commercial timber, although we think of these medieval houses and things like that in, you know, in, in uh, various places in, in England and see the half timbers there. But if you look carefully at all of them, very few of those are actually one continuous piece of lumber. People were joiners, and they actually joined all these pieces of lumber together and that was, that was a major job to take these smaller pieces and, and put them together. But, but you would, if you're going to get into timber, I mean for lumber, you would probably let this grow uh, quite a bit more, maybe another 50 years, or you probably wouldn't even use much of a copy system. But you would cut this down, you'd sort it into poles, you'd sort some of it into various canes that you would use, and of course up until, you know, most, roughly around the Industrial Revolution, about half of England or more lived in mud and wattle huts. So you would sell a lot of that as wattles that you would mix in with the, with the clay and the dirt and that sort of stuff. And that would be your wall. And the average house lasted about maybe 80 years and it would just kind of decay. But that was a, a big system. And then even the smaller pieces you would sell off as firewood, the larger ones you would use for and, and make into charcoal. So if you kind of kept this going, after about 30 years, it looked like this. And by this point now, the canopy is kind of closed. So you have a very different system for insects and invertebrates uh, and if you're and, and understory plants. So a lot of this coppicing where you had a continuous heterogeneous rotation allowed for very specific adaptations for uh, different types of especially of, of insects but also some uh, specialized types of understory plants. And then if this would be more when it probably was going to be abandoned which is much of the coppiced woods now you go in them and you say, oh, these, you see the stool there, and then you'd have these larger trunks coming out of them. Those are all one tree and uh, genetically, and then uh, they've grown out of that stump and uh, turned into, into quite large um, you know, uh, trunks now. And then you can get these really old ones where you get these big old copper stools that kind of in these enchanted forest, and they will uh, sometimes be massive have multiple growths out of them. And if you core into some of that wood uh, and actually count the, the rings on them, it'll be 400, 500, 600 years old for, for many of those. So, and they can kind of have these fantastic shapes. And, and, and there's a lot of them in, in a particular ancient forest. So it is an unusual, that, you know, you don't just pick out one or two of these. Those, those are relatively common. So this is high fields, just not far at all from the Whirl House. And that area, they believe there's, a, there's an ancient woodlands there, and they believe these particular plants, if you went down, not the wood we see there, but if you went down in the stump below the stool, uh, that, that those date back about 1,800 years back to uh, Roman times. So there's a fair amount of unique biodiversity in these areas that some of the understory plants are all, have been adapted to or only found in these coppiced areas, and only if they've been kind of continuously coppiced because of the rotational system where they need 
specific levels of light, uh, especially open light areas, uh, in order to bloom and for the seed to germinate. So a couple of these are bluebells and wood anemone are pretty much only found in old coppice systems or new coppice systems, but they're certainly associated with, with coppice systems that are, that are open uh, and have some light coming through. And they can, people in England love these. They're, you know, obviously uh, beautiful, so they, they really want to, one of the pitches for preserving the ancient forest is that uh, you can preserve the bluebells and the, the wood anemones. So there's also a fair amount of insects that also, which I'll talk about a little bit later, that uh, are adapted to this type of system as well. So while I was in England this last fall, when I was on a research leave, uh, I was able to spend a couple months there partly at Oxford and partly going to different woodland sites, ancient woodland sites throughout England, mostly within, actually kind of uh, conveniently, most of them are, are many of them are located not far from a triangle between London, Oxford, and Cambridge. So you can kind of hit the big, the big three in terms of uh, academics and be able to see a lot of the ancient forests. So I looked at these and kind of ground truth these and then we would look at inventories of rare plants and insects. Most of these work, I should say, has been, the inventories have been done by, by other people. In the old days, there weren't very much, but now there's such an interest in it. The Woodland Trust and the various trust of, uh, conservatory trust of, of England have documented these pretty well. In a few cases, we, or I did uh, some other work on my own in kind of assaying which insects were there, but most of it was done by other people. So a couple indicator tree species, and they're kind of in order here. Wild service tree is, is mostly kind of an understory tree, not very big, not very impressive. It has been uh, adapted, so it has some domesticated uh, varieties, including I think you can, your service tree in, in, the, in the US, they produce a little fruit on them, which is edible. Um, but wild service tree is an indicator that that forest has never been cut, at least many people claim that, or, or is really, really undisturbed. So uh, it's kind of fascinating that there are a few places, uh, even within Hampstead Heath, uh, which is you know, only th three miles, four miles from, you can look down and see the, you know, the city of London, the old London, uh, from that, that there are service trees in some parts of Hampstead Heath uh, that suggest that it was never cut at all. Uh, so that's a, that's a big indicator of ancient forest and really, really, and perhaps no disturbance. Sessile oak, there's two main types of oak in England, uh, pedunculate, which means it's got a little uh, hanging stem for it that the acorns grow on, and then sessile, where the acorns are uh, directly attached to the stem. Uh, there, both can be in ancient forests, but sessile oak, uh, the one that where there is no uh, peduncle, uh, is another indicator of ancient woodlands. It can have some disturbance, but if it's ever been cut, uh, the landowner almost certainly put back pedunculate oak because it had a much higher commercial value and could, sessile oak goes kind of crooked and isn't quite as tall. Uh, and slower growing, so it was not commercially as valuable as uh, pedunculate oak. So it was usually almost always replaced with pedunculate. So that's another indicator. And then hornbeam and hazel are, were often used for coppicing because they grow very fast, uh, as, and sometimes um, beech as well. And then you had these understory flowers of bluebell, wood anemone, and, and primrose, all of which would be good indicators of ancient woodlands. The largest uh, ancient forest in England is actually just in suburban or exurban London. So if you just north of London is a place called Epping Forest that is, what's right, if, if you know London at all, there's a big ring road around uh, London. And that actually is just, uh, well actually kind of bisects parts of Epping Forest. So Epping Forest was a, a royal hunting preserve uh, including uh, Queen Elizabeth had a, a hunting house there, or a hunting lodge there, and it was preserved, but it was managed. So it was, 
stock or a deer were, were put in there of various types, but most of the uh, forest there is pollarded because there were deer there. So they, they, if you're going to have deer as a hunting, for hunting purposes, you almost had to pollard your trees because otherwise the deer would eat all the coppice shoots that were coming out to, uh, low. So much of that forest there is going to be pollarded, and it's the biggest ancient forest in, in England, and it's about 2,000 hectares, so that's roughly about 5,000 acres. Uh, so that's by far and away the biggest one and, and has uh, this kind of spectacular uh, pollarded forest through quite a bit of it. And much of it also has this, this ditch and bank system because it was a, it's a pretty linear forest. It wasn't like a square. So it had a lot of boundaries that they wanted to make sure the local folks or other people knew about that they were going into the royal forest and didn't want them to trespass. Occasionally you have these kind of really fantastic looking coppices. This, this is a hornbeam one here where it's grown at, at, at different times and died off. So. Okay, it's been a little bit here on um, insects in there because that's about, for about the last 15 years or so we've been doing a lot of work with beetles and I knew nothing about beetles uh, before that but we wanted to look at things that have a lot of species and whether you aware or not but about one third of all animal species are beetles. So there's a huge number of beetle species out there. So we wanted something that was really speciose, something we could collect in pretty high numbers. And we were also interested in, so we focused on a subset of beetles that don't fly. So they're, they're pretty much in place and don't disperse very well. So many of these uh, species are, because if they're associated with ancient forests, are either rare and endangered or threatened uh, and may only occur in a few places in, in England. This particular one is, a, and it wasn't taken by me, um, but it was a, a firefly pass. So we've seen a big decrease, I don't know, in your lifetime, but you've seen a lot fewer fireflies around, and part of that is because of, of the change in our, in our forest. And okay, so just, we'll, I'll run through a couple of these, won't bore you with too many of them. Uh, more the, the pretty ones, uh, because these are, um, uh, so these are ones that people tend to focus on because they're, they're we call them flagship species because they care. I, man, that, that, that violet beetle can really just kind of knock the socks off of you and we really like that. So we're, we will definitely want to preserve that. We don't, little black beetle, which might be rare, we don't care about it. You know, you got, you got 12,000 black beetles, you know, but if we get a, a nice purple one, uh, we're much more interested about it. And that's kind of true for a lot of our things. You know, we're, we care about things that are, that are, have, have fur or eyes or, uh, and have big eyes especially, uh, or feathers, you know, but, or they look really pretty. And we'll put a lot of money into those and not so much other things, just kind of natural human uh, uh, kind of bias there. So many of these are going to be found in the ancient trees, uh, including in the coppice schools, as they kind of rot out. So uh, that's why they're, they're very, uh, they're found in so few places. So this one's only known from Windsor Forest. If you're ever in Windsor Castle, it actually has a, it's primarily a wood pasture uh, area with these big old trees in front of it, but it does have some ancient woodlands in it as well. And then we have the cardinal click beetle, again, mostly found in kind of this rotting heartwood of, of much of the ancient oaks. And this it's a little color palette here, we got purple, we got red, we got some bright green ones, you know. So, um, so this is another one that people like to focus on because it's got this beautiful metallic green uh, sheen on it. And again, uh, found primarily in these uh, very large oaks that tend to uh, have rotted heartwood in them, or hornbeams as well. And this one's uh, a cute little one that is quite small, but uh, has this really nice golden glow on it. So uh, people tend to focus on these. And we, I, we have a pretty good, oh, one last one here, I think. Okay, so this is another one that's found just at Windsor Forest. And s most of these beetles are actually very vicious predators. Uh, especially, well, both as the adults and as the, the larvae, and you can see those nice jaws and those things, they will prey on other invertebrates. And this particular one only preys on this other beetle larvae. So uh, it's consequently got a, a very specialized lifestyle and, and is only found in, in, in one place here. So again, from a kind of more micro, well, not quite microscopic, but a small point of view, many of these things really have these gorgeous sheens to them, certainly the ones that that uh, we tend to have some interest in. And I love to tell the story that we've done a lot of work here in the temperate zone as well, including Great Smoky Mountains National Park. 
So when I and, and so we of course you have to get collecting permits from the Park Service and those sort of things. But but um, when about five years ago uh, there was a group of collectors from Europe that hired two Czech men to come over and rustle beetles out of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They set up illegal traps and uh, pitfall traps that these things fall into. And we did similar types of things, but of course ours were, were legal. Park Service saw them and uh, staked out the ones, and uh, they are now serving jail time uh, for rustling beetles out of it because they very deliberately set these things up. And you know, if you and I went, or not me, but if you went in there and took a beetle, they'd slap your hand or give you a little you know, $25 fine or something like that. But these people were actually uh, selling. And there's a, a pretty active eBay sites for selling beetles, which is kind of surprising. I mean, there's collectors of everything. And in fact, I'll, I'll talk about that probably quite soon here, I think. Okay. And around here, we have, uh, it, as we do in England, we have some of these rhinoceros beetles, which we have here as well, including in the little woods right next to uh, Ronaldo Gardens. There's rhinoceros beetles in there. And kids and others love to play with them. But they're protected. Uh, the, those in the stag beetles are protected throughout England because they have so little rare, mature forest that there isn't a whole lot of them here. They're, they're not protected here unless you're in mostly in a national park or something like that. So these stag beetles can develop these huge kind of front mandibles that they use primarily for um, uh, inner comp competition among males for, for females. And we get, again, uh, a scarab beetle, common one there. It isn't so pretty from this side, but when you flip it over, it has this really nice violet iridescence in it. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to look for is how these insect records may have changed over time and whether they're still present in many of these forests. So in a previous trip, uh, I noticed that there were some records that were in more pronounced scientific journals, but there were a lot of records that were in Shire records. So the Shires were the ancient counties of England. They've been kind of such recombined now. But people were really into, especially the gentry, were really into collecting in the 19th century, 18th century, up until about World War II, if you were a landed gentry, you know, like from Downton Abbey, the Lord probably went out, he collected, he had his bird collection he wanted to show you, or his butterflies, or he may have other things, but a lot of them were naturalists. And uh, so they would record some of these in these kind of local journals that pretty much disappeared, but, but the Bodleian Library, the, the main library uh, in, the, ancient, the older library in Oxford, and uh, to a lesser degree, the one in Cambridge, had a number of these, and I thought, well, this will give us a great historical record to be able to look through those and see which ones have disappeared, which ones are still there. So I did that and um, followed in the footsteps here of Charles Darwin. So Darwin started as a young man. He collected. He was landed gentry up uh, kind of in northwest part of England uh, near the Welsh border, and he collected beetles. And he collected. He kept thinking about these beetles. Says, "Man, I've got a great beetle collection." There's all these. First of all, what does this tell us about there are so many darn species here? And secondly, I'll notice there's little variants among them. And how did those kind of happen? And how did they change in all these different types? So his first real inspiration about evolution, which he later got from a number of other sources and, and kind of developed, was basically on beetle development. So uh, he, there are still beetle specimens of his that, were, that are uh, at Oxford. So he's, he's there, and also at Cambridge. So. And they did the same thing with, with kind of butterflies. I, I focused mostly on the, on the beetles. So the Bodleian is a really cool place to be. You have to take an oath. You have to get a card there, and you have to take an oath, solemnly the oath with your hand up uh, on a Bible or some other thing you want to use. And it says, uh, I, I will respect the books, and I will not bring fire into the library. And then they issue you your card. Uh, and about the, this is the Radcliffe camera there, but the old Bodleian Library is in there. And even if you haven't been there, you'll probably recognize some scenes from it because this one is from Harry Potter. Uh, and this was the, they had it in two different scenes, I believe. One was the old infirmary, and the other one was the ballroom dance hall. They use scenes from this. And parts of this, which is the rare book room where I was uh, for a while with the Shire records, uh, that was part of Dumbledore's uh, study. 
um, uh, parts, good parts of both Cambridge and, and also some of the old colleges there. I was, I was actually at a relatively new college, only 200 or 300 years old, but some of the big modeling and, and uh, Christ, uh, Christ Church College, they're the ones that uh, they have the big banquet halls that you see from Harry Potter as well. So it's a, kind of a fascinating place to, to be. So I searched these, uh, and I have to say, it uh, didn't work out so well. Um, I thought from the early ones that I'd be able to get a lot more records than I could. What records I did have, um, they often weren't scientists who did this, and they would describe this beetle, but you couldn't tell what it was, or they misidentified it. And they often would say, I got this from Nottingham, uh, which Shire it was from, but they wouldn't say which specific wood. Or, uh, so it was very hard to cross-locate those. So I'd have to say I kind of, not quite struck out, but it was of limited use anyway. So, <coughs> but we did, what we were, I was much more successful in kind of looking at some of the factors of how rare, relatively rare, rare and endangered species were occur. So there's about four or five of those that I'll run through in the last minute or two, last couple of minutes here. One was, is it going to be related to the area size of the, of the ancient woods? So they, we had anything that was about the size of this room to things that were Epping Forest, you know, the size of 5,000 acres. And surprisingly, there's virtually no relationship, except for the fact that as you increase area, it doesn't grow up logarithmically, but if you add more and more different type of habitats, you might have a coppice forest here, you might have a pollarded forest over here, or you might have a stream over there. As you add more habitat types to an area, it's going to affect it. But the actual area itself didn't have much influence, which is good from a conservation point of view. It means that, that small habitats can really be quite effective for these types of rare and endangered understory plants and for the insect. How about the age? Well, we kind of already from my experimental technique, if you want to call it that, I only looked at forests that were 500 years old or older. So those were probably, there, was, there wasn't much difference between a 500-year-old forest and a 1,000-year-old forest. But that's partly maybe that the 500-year-old forest, we couldn't date back to 1,000 years, but may have been a forest that long. So if we looked at relatively young forests that may, maybe went up to 200 years, I think we would have found an effect that certainly anything much younger than that we would have. But um, we were primarily focusing on, on just ancient forests, so we didn't have much of a major factor there. Tree species composition. Okay, um, so we thought if there's a wild service tree there, this is a really great indicator that there's been virtually no disturbance. Um, and so we did see some effect there, uh, especially for the insects. It was depending upon what tree species are going to be there, but it wasn't necessarily the old, the, the one, the biggest what most dominant indicator of, of an old forest would be the wild service tree, but more whether we had large old oak trees there that could rot out in the middle since these are very kind of rot dependent with decaying heartwood. So those, if we had those there, you'd much more likely to find the rare uh, and endangered insects. Service trees are really small. They don't rot out. Uh, they only get to be eh, about this big as a trunk. So there was going to be much less of an effect there for, the, for these insects. Okay, um, the presence of large old trees. So we have some areas that are just coppiced, pollarded. The trees may not actually be very old, but we did have an effect here again, uh, kind of inversely for moss and butterflies. So if the area was actively coppiced, you had a lot of light coming in there, they had the flowers they could live with or live on, then that's pretty much the only place you would find these moths and butterflies and a few other insects like crane flies and a few things like that were in these open, actively coppiced areas. So that's had a, a major influence on how conservation occurs in this area. Coppicing is, is very labor intensive. It um, costs a lot of money if you're going to pay somebody to do it or you have to have a lot of volunteers who are willing to put a lot of sweat equity into this land because you have to cut it all the time. You have to put everything on a rotational cycle. So there is a lot of interest now from various conservation groups in England that they will maintain active coppicing. And you can kind of help support this if you want because you can, you can buy charcoal that's produced from, from coppiced areas as, as a byproduct of this. And of course, it's going to be at a premium if you were going to mark it up for its real cost. 
but you're actually helping maintain compost areas in these, in these, uh, in these moths and butterflies. On the other hand, beetles, and to a lesser degree, some of the flies and bees and wasps, those are going to be associated with these big, large trees where you wouldn't want to have any composting. So it depends on really what you want to preserve, what your kind of land management strategy is going to be. How about whether you had a whole cluster of ancient forest together? Because in some places they are fragmented, but they may only be like, you know, a mile away, you'll have another ancient forest. Sometimes the nearest neighbor may be 100 miles. Maybe not quite that far, but, but we didn't see much effect on that. But again, we were almost all of these rare and endangered species are things that aren't very agile. That is, they don't transport very well. We deliberately looked at beetles that didn't fly. The moths and butterflies do. We didn't spend much time on those yet. Maybe we'll, we'll look at those. Um, they, can, they can move quite a bit, but actually they're, they're very closely associated with different plant types. So they don't move very far because there's no good habitat for them. And the management is, is the real key part. So if some areas, it, if you have active management with this composting, I kind of talked about, uh, and you have to maintain certain cycle lengths for them, and certainly have to have very heterogeneous habitats within an ancient forest plot land in order to maintain many of these kind of moths and butterflies and the understory plants. But on the other hand, if you want to maintain the insects, then you basically go over to a strategy of benign neglect. Just let those trees kind of rot away and don't cut them down and that'll promote uh, a lot of the uh, habitat that would be uh, conducive for, for the insects. Okay, um, so thank you very much for your attention. I have a few acknowledgments here. Uh, you know, the, the Nathan and Julie Hatch, uh, well, it's actually their name I found out because I actually found out when I was at Oxford, I was introduced to the donor who, who endows this program to send somebody over to Oxford each year. Uh, it's actually a big hedge fund manager, uh, not surprising. Uh, but, uh, and he was very, he wanted me to know right away, oh, they didn't, they didn't pay that. No, I gave that money, you know, in their name. And so, but, but he was a great guy. And, and uh, he's also on a couple trustees from, from Oxford and also from Notre Dame, where, where of course, President Hatch came from. So, so but, it's, but it's a great opportunity uh, that they send somebody over to Oxford each year. And um, the university itself has some great librarians, great research people. And uh, I stayed at Harris Manchester College and they were, they were wonderful. And we have a longtime colleague at St. Peter's who has worked with the environmental program here, which uh, I've been involved with quite a bit, and also with the medieval program. So uh, his name is Ken Addison and he's uh, paved some ways for me over there and allowed me to stay at St. Peter's a number of times. So, so thanks to all of them. So, okay, be glad to. Uh, yeah, anybody got any questions or, or comments? Glad to take any of those. I know we have a few people who have been in these areas and, and uh, are interested in them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So most of those, like, colorful beetles, they were much more common back in medieval times and you can find some historical records for them that they were in other areas but now that most of those so the, the amount of woods that are coppiced now actively coppiced I'm kind of guessing is like one percent or less than it was at its height in you know 1500 or 1600 um, so those areas have really kind of shrunk down and and most of the even active coppicing they had a, a, a definite lull after World War II to about the 1970s, so now they're 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 doing a lot more active coppicing in, in these areas, and, and it's kind of a disappointment in some ways. You think, oh, ancient woods, I'm going to see these big old trees, and oh, you see these like shrubs kind of all over at different stages. So, but the the real fascination, if you could get down there, would be in the in the root systems. So, yeah. yeah. Has there been an effort to preserve Yeah. So so not until about 1970 they were actively tearing them down. No one really cared a whole lot about them, of course. A lot of our environmental movement here started in the 1960s, but I would say with Rackham's book, he really kind of raised the consciousness for that. Uh, and they were both kind of, he was centered out of Cambridge, but between Cambridge and Oxford, they kind of a big, and, and again, in the time I've been kind of working over there uh, um, in the last 10 years or so on this, uh, there's been a huge interest now. I mean, people, 
love to go to these forests. There is a lot more active management of them. So even in the last 10 years, and I think there, it's kind of, you know, I think it's almost like a pledge that they will not cut down any ancient forest unless it's absolutely necessary. So, um, and there's a lot more discovery of what ancient forests are left. So a lot of them are really quite small, but um, people just said, oh, there's an old woods over there, and you know, it's kind of all overgrown. And now they realize, oh, that may have been, you know, look back on old records or, or uh, look at some of the, you know, the, the management things and say, oh, that was a, you know, that was a woods that, that, that the monastery owned and was actively managed and, and, uh, and used. So. Okay, well, thank you all for coming out on kind of a dreary day and <laughs> walking through, at least, uh, what, not quite directly, but uh, through the slides, an ancient forest. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs>